Yes. Yes. Yep, let people in. <laughs> Johnny, you can turn that up. You want to turn that up? You can turn that up. No, oh, sorry. Guys, come on in. So Greetings to you who have gathered for the event entitled How to Train a Neural Network, AI and Music. Please take a moment to settle in and enjoy the proceedings. Rest assured, clearly marked fire exits are available and we encourage lively discussions throughout the day. As you can tell, I am an AI-generated deepfake. My name is Donna, and I embody a synergistic fusion of human and machine intelligence. I speak to you through the voice of Francisca Schroeder, utilizing DID's revolutionary generative AI technology, which enables me to guide the movements and expressions of a still photograph. This photograph was generated using Lexica Arts Stable Diffusion, which imbues me with an alluring female cyborg aesthetic.
Franziska Schröder created me as a double, a doppelganger. And in the context of training a neural network, which is the focus of our discussion today, the process is not merely concerned with the production of another or an evil twin, as the doppelganger has been depicted in mythology and folklore. With an alluring female. As you may observe, from the AI generated video displayed on the last Francisca Schroeder created me as a double the cyborg, appears to multiply, even triple at times. The aim of allowing a machine to listen to an input, such as Francisca's saxophone, is not to establish a dichotomy between woman and machine. This is not a search for fragmentation between me and machine. I cannot help but recall Donna Haraway's investigation of the cyborg, a figure that challenges the distinction between human and animal, woman and machine, the physical and the non-physical. The cyborg embodies a quest for a biological process that possesses the indifference of evolutionary development within a complex and dynamic system. Francisca, can you please take over from here on, as I have reached the limits of chat GPT, the optimizing language model for dialogue developed by OpenAI. I know you will sound as lovely as myself. Well, you've given me your voice, but your appearance is not coming anywhere close to my gorgeous AI look. But thank you for bringing me into this world. Well, you're welcome, Donna. And I think Har Haraway Cyborg is indeed um, a central creature, as she says, a hybrid of machine and organism. Uh, she calls it a creature of social reality as well as a creature of fiction. And I think, Donna, you um, embody this quite nicely. Um, so thank you for introducing today's event, Donna. And um, if you guys wondered about the track that was playing when you came in, um, in the spirit of today, um, everything being about AI, um, this track was created using AI, AI Eva. Um, this is the artificial intelligence virtual composer. Um, and you may have noticed that I was using my own recorded and processed voice. Um, and I was playing on the sounds of the word cyborg, as you may have noticed. Um, so uh, I would like to elaborate today um, on what Chris and I have been working on um, over the last couple of months uh, and weeks. And for this, I would like to situate my own um, thinking, my own work as an improviser, as a musician, really tease out some ideas about um, artificial intelligence. So. Um, why has it become so a pre preoccupation for me? And I kind of started last year when I encountered the truly amazing and mind-blowing work of um, AI artist Glenn Marshall. Um, he happens to live in Northern Ireland. If you haven't come across him, I urge you to look him up. So some of my own work finds its roots um, in some of the visual um, explorations using stable diffusion models, a technique that I've employed um, for creating visuals. Um, you're seeing some here, you've seen some at the background. So I'm using prompting techniques and style transfer techniques. Um, and as I said, some of this is an exploration around this idea of cyborg, um, around the idea of a doppelganger. And I will get back to this. Um, but the visuals there, they make, make reference to this uh, disembodied other um, and something that I think might emerge when I train a neural network with my own input and in this case I have been working with PRISM, um, Emily who will speak later with Chris on um, using my own saxophone improvised material as input. So the visuals, um, they are AI generated with text prompts such as a fantasy style portrait painting of a female charismatic bird playing the saxophone, a cyborg imbued um, with humanoid industrial robotic features rendered in golden ratio, Unreal Engine Octane Render, amongst many other prompting techniques. So these visuals have just been a starting point for me to delve into what artificial intelligence, intelligence might add or it might not add to me as an improviser and for my context of music improvisation. So evidently the question arises, what is really the art in this? 
And uh, especially if you think about um, that some of these prompting techniques undoubtedly feast off, or I should probably say rip off, many um, unknowing artists' work. So some of you might be um, aware of the work by Matt Dryhurst and Holly Herndon. Um, they created a tool, Spawning AI, um, which is an AI tool set that, that tackles some of these issues. They build a tool for artists um, so that artists could find out if they've been trained into a set or for, uh, without having been um, consulted, so without their consent. And um, I come back to this idea of fair use of data in a little bit. And um, the other bit I am questioning really is about intelligence. So what is intelligent when we speak of AI? So one concern of mine is how to harness AI, and I know um, Emily is going to speak about this uh, as well, and around machine learning in building what I imagine to be something like an immersive, improvising AI performance ecosystem. And I'm going to nod to you, Simon, here, to your 2007 EMS paper. Um, and I think many of us reference uh, Simon's paper as the sort of father for the concept of performance ecosystems. So that's something I'm kind of interested in building, a kind of an immersive performance ecosystem using AI and music improvisation. And it might explore a neural network that is trained on the sounds and the sort of idiosyncrasies of my own playing. And for me, it's actually been quite a sort of a childlike excitement in this process. Uh, it's definitely a creative inquiry of finding things out as you go along. You put stuff into the system and so on. And Possibly another nod here and uh, work I've been really influenced by is Yvonne Rogers' idea of living on the wild side. She ca calls it a process that requires a transdisciplinary mindset of folding and mashing and extrapolating different concepts, values, concerns and findings. This reminds me of what is at the core of Andrew Pickering's Mangle of Practice, as expounded in his seminal work, Time, Agency and Science. Here lies a profound insight into the complex web of relationships between machines, instruments, facts, theories, mathematical structures, Discipline practices and human beings. The very notion of this mangle underscores the interconnectedness of these various elements in ways that defy predictability and are indelibly shaped by the contingency of culture, time, and place. As Pickering says, mangled together in unforeseeable ways that are shaped by the contingencies of culture, time and place. The marvel of the neural network lies in the host of unforeseen outcomes and emergent properties that arise from the constantly changing parameters of interaction. It is this dynamic and constantly shifting relationship between myself, machine and other collaborators that renders the collaboration inextricably mangled as it emerges from the context of their encounters. Such an encounter is not merely a technical or instrumental one, but it is imbued with a creative and social dimension. In entrusting a fragment of myself to the system, i.e. improvised saxophone sounds, I'm simultaneously cognizant of the manifold affordances that the entire system and its agents present. This concept of situated AI, envisioned by performer Paolo Dahlstedt, as discussed in last year's AI conference in Stockholm, serves as a convincing reminder of the manifold notions of entanglement, self-interaction, self-alienation, and the relationship between artificial and human agency that are germane to the collaboration. So I'm quite excited by this fickle relationship of myself and the machine, and the machine who, may I say who, is ready to receive my idiosyncrasies, my improvised sounds when 
And I was wondering what the machine, or what she will make of it. And indeed, when preparing a recording, and this is back in February, I um, prepared a recording, an hour of input material, something that Chris would feed the machine for, in order for her learn, to learn about me, about my playing. I actually felt a certain tenderness, a kindness towards this unknown entity, this network, this machine, that I assumed would ready herself to receive my sounds. She would open herself towards me to accept myself and hopefully engage with me in a collective, collaborative and somehow creative and social encounter. I realize I'm giving the machine somewhat human qualities here and thinking of her accepting me and engaging with me. And it might seem controversial to some of you, especially if you subscribe to a paradigm that's been known as um, CASA, Computers are Social Actors. And it comes from a paper from Nas and Yang Mi Moon called Machines and Mindlessness. And they argue there, although this is back in 2002 already, that people somehow mindlessly apply social rules and expectations to computers, even though they should know that these machines do not have feelings, intentions, or mo motivations, or human motivations. And um, we might argue that machines may not or may not yet have human motivations, or as, at least in the way we understand motivations from a human perspective, or that they might not have feelings. But it is certainly something very social about the interaction and training a machine to listen to you. And the idea of sociality in AI is really important to me, and it also chimes with what Eric Drott has called socializing AI. It's his uh, idea on emergent properties that are brought to light by AI. And he said, we cannot simply understand them as a surplus rendered by the technology per se, but he argues there's a social dimension to data and there's a collective musical knowledge that is extracted. So the social character, and he says, needs to be acted upon and actively trained in for the public interest. I find that quite ex uh, interesting. Uh, he said last year, and he again spoke at the conference in Stockholm I attended, he was talking about the need for socializing AI. And this is a quote from him saying, AI will only realize its full potential if it is socialized, treated not as a source of privatized riches, but as a form of public wealth instead. I want us to bear this, this in mind as it touches upon issues of fair access. And so training a neural network is, of course, a creative, a collective, and it's a social act. So, and in being social, involving not only machines, networks, structures, data, and so on, but it involves the touch of human beings, um, I think we cannot escape an entanglement with issues such as data bias, access, gender, and ethical questions around fair use of data. And it's actually an issue that Lucy Sachmann already spoke about in, back in 2018. She um, wrote this quite exciting text called Why the Sky is Falling, and she cautioned there of the what she calls the spectacle of the superintelligentsia at war with each other. So she was talking about this unhelpful binary stance where on one side AI is somehow proceeding towards this visible horizon of superintelligence, so we're all going to be outsmarted by the AI, right? And on the other side, she, on the other hand, she's talking about um, AI somewhat being benevolent and will never dominate or question the primacy of human control. But she goes on to say that this binary discourse actually distracts from the increasing entrenchment of digital infrastructures built out of unaccountable practices of classification, categorization, and profiling. And I side her, uh, with her with complete and utter human passion on this. She says the greatest danger is that of detrimental prejudice. So the decision-making processes of who's programming the system, who's making the decisions to tweak, who's training, who's retraining, who's accepting, discarding. And I know Chris will come back to this idea as well of um, decision-making. And so these are decisions that are up to now, at least I think, still made by humans. Um, but this important topic of the ethics around AI is a discussion for another time. And, um, some of my colleagues in the room, we are part of a larger network of international, for the International Institute of Critical Studies, uh, the IICSI, and um, we're going to uh, have Martin Clancy, and I've left a reference here, who has 
very recently brought out an excellent book on artificial intelligence and music ecosystems. Uh, it builds on his PhD, which he wrote just a couple of years ago. Um, and he will join us later for a debate on the um, idea of music and AI and um, ethical um, debates. Um, so let me just come back to this idea of training a neural network with my own improvised sounds. And you are forgiven to think this might seem a truly indulgent and possibly egocentric and potentially uninteresting endeavor. I mean, I just did ask myself, do I really want to double or triple myself? And is that really exciting? But what is of interest to me really is rather than the outcome, you know, having a bit more of myself or having something that is based on myself, but the exciting and creative potential I see in the process of inquiry, it lies in the actual decision makings and it's not just about my own, but Chris, of course. And um, I agree with Chris and he talks so poignantly about what the system actually does sort of in the middle. So we provide it with human input with saxophone sound in my case, and then we get something out at the end, right? We get more improvised music out. But what's happening inside the box, and Chris has got to talk about the magic inside the box. So when the system does its magic, the process where it works stuff out, which is the sort of nitty gritty, it's the, the messy bit. And that's actually the interesting bit. And when you see the numbers spinning, it is quite mind blowing. Um, so Chris quite nicely put it when I asked him, you know, what is it the system actually does? He told me it generates probability distributions, right? So the system somehow works out what the probability of the next sample might be. So you give it a sample, what is likely to happen um, based on that prediction. And that is crazy. And I know there's improvisers in this room. And I was thinking, as an improviser, a lot of times, well, you don't know, or in fact, we often try not to know. We try to put ourselves sometimes, not always, in the space of where we actually want to forget around the stance of what is coming next. We don't necessarily always want to predict our own actions. So whether the system achieves this or might not be you know, the poignant issue, and he said it's also never the same, what it does in between. So you might feed it, for example, you might feed it 10 seconds of sound and make 10 variations based on that, based on the feature of that data set that it had already learned from, from you. So we can say that things somehow grow from emergence inside that system. But what was exciting for me to understand um, is that the system is actually really hungry for a large data set. And I may have come to this very uh, naive because I had mistakenly assumed that I would need to feed it something really simple, like simple lines, a simple chunk of musical data. But actually, au contraire, Chris said, you have to provide me with a large data set, and I quote him, sameness, but with difference within that sameness. Yes, and I had to also wrap my head around this. So I repeat this, he said, I need you to provide me sameness, but with difference within that sameness. And I sort of had to work out what that might mean musically. So the system produces variations and it learns general features. In a way, it's trying to generalize of what it's heard. So you need something different within the sameness for it to learn something about you. Um, but something very inhomogeneous. And I thought maybe like multiphonics or something crazy, something you know, that changes all the time would be not really that suited then. But it turns out, and Chris, you will hopefully back me up on this, by the way that something that changes all the time, it's, it's basically also, also changing and it is homogeneity in itself. So what really I understood about training a neural network is that the network itself improvises. So it is actually a really good thing to be an improviser and work with an improvising neural net, it seems. So I'm coming to an end, but I have embarked on this journey and together with Emily and others. And so I think in that way, it's become a real way of socializing with other people. It's become around accepting, learning, learning together, very much become about gradual forgetting because you need to force the system to forget certain things. I mean, it can't cope with everything you give it. Um, so it is this process of meaning making. And for me, in the end, it's not been about what the technology really does, either what it does by itself or in between or what it adds to what I'm doing. But really, my hope in the end is that when I'm building the system, I want to sort of find out what this neural net is making me do differently as a musician, as an improviser, as a person. And Donna has already started invading my life. So I think there's already some 
um, feedback going on there. Um, but I think in doing, in, in, in this sort of process of working with a neural net, it's hopefully going to be a really exciting endeavor of where you can harvest sort of the complexity of human behavior, and that's, that is my hope. Um, I am going to finish with um, uh, one of Lucy Sachman's thought, um, because she was arguing about humans who inform the input, and she said it is not really about um, the process, but it is about humans who evaluate the input and the output, and um, we need to sort of bear that in mind at the moment. She said humans must take the responsibility for the cultural assumptions and political and economic interests on which these operations are based. And she said, for the life and death consequences that already follow, but she was talking about AI-powered weapons, but I think we can't escape this whole um, um, discussion around AI, not just in music, but it's obviously used in a lot of other uh, areas. So I will invite Chris and Emily to speak on the PRISM neural network, on the ideas of how to use AI in sort of musical creativity and composition. Um, but I leave you with one short contemplation, my little AI secret. So you had have met Donna, my deep fake doppelganger. You've heard an AI composed track, uh, sort of a trap track as an introduction. And this text that I have presented, these thoughts that I formed, um, they were written by myself, so they came out of this body. But a small part, uh, with the help of ChatGPT, and Donna referred to this, um, was rewritten in the style of a philosopher. So I let you ponder whether you noticed or whether you would like to even have noticed, but I would like you not to feel in any sense betrayed, as um, I very much think that AI is all around us, it's everywhere, and I've kind of welcomed her into my improvised and academic life. And with that, I hand over um, to Chris, and I'm just um, I'm going to switch over to Teams. Chris couldn't be with us today. He, is, uh, he had health problems and couldn't travel. So, Chris, I'm going to hand over to you on Teams. If you just give us a second to bring you online. Um, Chris, I hope you have followed the proceedings. I have indeed. So, Chris is going to speak to us about uh, PRISM and the neural network and the process of training a neural network. Chris, you can switch on your camera. Do that, yes. There you go. Hello, everybody. Uh, and yes, apologies that I couldn't be there today in person. Um, but uh, I'm with you through the magic of teams. <laughs> so, I'll share my screen. Um, okay, hopefully you can. Apologies, hopefully you can see. Yeah, we can see. My screen, yes, there you go. It will. Chris, I know you can't really see the room, but I'm going to sit and watch your slides. So walk away, but we can hear oh. you. Okay, that's fine. Yes, so. Um, Yes, over the last few weeks or months, really, um, Francisco and I have been working uh, to train a neural network um, on some of her saxophone improvisations uh, using PRISM's uh, software, PRISM Sample RNN. So I'm going to talk a bit about how we did that and what it means to train a neural network, how you, how you do it. So, um, yes, so I'm PRISM's uh, research software engineer uh, at the moment um, in RNCM. And so I wrote the code. I'm a composer myself, so I can give me a, a unique perspective on these kinds of things. Uh, and yes, so I, I wrote the code that uh, we ran to train the network. So um, it's worth asking uh, an important question what is a neural network? Um, and well, we kind of already know the answer to that because we have biological neural networks already in existence, have been for many million years, millions of years. Um, so neural networks are an attempt to model the kind of things that go on inside the brain, essentially. So that's um, a neuron, a biological neuron. 
and a neuron is essentially just a, an input up, output system. It takes a signal at one end, passes through the the body of the neuron, and comes out at the other end according to whether uh, it is at a certain level. So there's a kind of a gate, it's a kind of gated system, and, um, whether it fires or not. So, so this is a diagram of a type of one of the earliest types of networks, um, because neural networks have actually been actually around since the 1950s or even earlier. Uh, this is a uh, an image of a multi-layer perceptron. So, if you look at this, is kind of horizontally as well. So, if you imagine that's vertically a biological neuron. And then horizontal, that's the same thing, uh, horizontally. So we have the input at the left-hand side and the output on the right-hand side. And the layers are the, see how the, the input layers feed through um, to each la layer within the internals of the system. And the boxes, the rectangular uh, shapes, the uh, letter F in them, actually that's not F, it's meant to be uh, sigma, because that's the, that's the activation um, which determines whether the, the actual signal carries through or not. So there are many different types of neural networks. Um, so the multi-layer perceptron, uh, which I just spoke about uh, convolutional neural networks, which are used in image processing a lot. Uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, RNNs. Uh, so sample RNN is actually an example of a, of a recurrent neural network. So that's its architecture. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. And obviously, uh, we've heard of GPT and chat GPT, uh, which are examples of transformers. So it's a particular type of kind of similar um, to recurrent neural networks, but with some uh, extra features. So, uh, audio applications of neural networks, we might ask, well, what, why would we use a neural network to um, train a neural network on, on, uh, on audio? Uh, why would, would we want to generate audio using a neural network? Uh, but it's not the only thing we can do with a neural network and audio. We can do, also do classification. Uh, which is, uh, you know, classification of genre, musical phrases, musical gestures, or, or audio, or even speech. Um, you know, classifying whether it's a male or female voice, that that kind of thing. Uh, but audio generation is what uh, Francisca and I have been doing with new, with uh, prison sample RNN, which is an example of neural synthesis. So we're synthesizing new, fresh audio uh, with the neural network. So it's generating fresh audio um, from an input data set. So yes, so RNNs are specialized neural networks for processing sequential data, and they learn the features of the data, and they generate new, new audio as variations on the input data. So, and uh, Francisca spoke about uh, a little bit about that uh, earlier. Um, and I will elaborate a little bit more on that in a moment. Um, so prism sample RNN itself, yeah, so it's a, it's an example of an RNN, a recurrent neural network, and it's a neural synthesis engine essentially written in Python. Uh, there is prior art existing. There was a version, uh, there was a, a paper published in 2017, but the code is uh, unmaintained and uh, no longer working. So. Uh, Prism's implementation is written using Google's TensorFlow 2 uh, AI engine uh, and it's supported. We support it and frequently update it. So it's a living project and it's, we've also added new features to it and it's much faster as well. And it's available if you're interested in taking a look at it. Look at it uh, it's available on Prism's GitHub page if you know GitHub. And um, But there's also a link on the README on the homepage for it. Um, to uh, a collab notebook. Uh, collab notebooks are ways of uh, essentially trying out new, uh, machine learning code without having to uh, mess around with the actual code itself. And you get a, you get access to a GP, GPU as well because you basically need a GPU to run this stuff. So some examples. 
Um, so back in about two years ago, now, 2021, it was during the pandemic, I, I um, trained sample RNN uh, on Beethoven, uh, the Beethoven, the 32 piano sonatas, the entire piano sonatas of Beethoven. And uh, I did this essentially in order to repeat an experiment because the original paper um, from 2017, that's what they did. They uh, they trained their network on uh, the piano sonatas of Beethoven, and I wanted to see if uh, we could do that also. So it's a kind of um, repeating the the experiment. It's kind of a scientific scientific method, you could say. So this is um, a sh very short example. Uh, it's about 30 seconds, 25 seconds of um, some output from sample on uh, after being trained on the Beethoven piano sonatas and um, so epoch uh, there just means how many times it's processed the, the input data set the entire Beethoven piano sonatas and the temperature is a, a, a parameter which determines the the randomness of the um, of the output, essentially, it's 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 sampling um, an output as Francisca mentioned. It's a probability distribution. What it actually outputs, finally, is a probability distribution, and then that is sampled using um, uh, as a kind of second tier of code. And uh, the temperature is this particular parameter for that that process, which which uh, determines the randomness. So I'll just play this for you. Hopefully, you'll be able to hear it. We did have a few problems earlier on, but this should hopefully come through. When I when I hear that, I always think that sounds a little bit like Schumann. <laughs> so uh, it's got that kind of nervous quality that Schumann's piano music has. Uh, but um, you don't always always get that, and um, it's often difficult to pr predict exactly what you will get. Um, and so this is an earlier epoch. This is earlier in the training process, at a different temperature. But I think that this sounds rather a lot like if you know Stockhausen's mantra. Uh, I think this sounds ra rather a lot like that, but there was no Stockhausen in the in the data set. It was all Beethoven. So, but this uh, you can hear the ring modulation in this, sort of like it. Second, I'll just repeat that. Yeah, so I, th I always think that that has that quality of uh, that piece by Stockhausen. Um, the ring modulation in particular is, uh, you know, kind of there. Why it's there, that's an interesting question. Um, but uh, I didn't get it from any other epoch. It was just that particular epoch when I trained it. So this is uh, some examples from the work I did with uh, on Francisca's uh, saxophone improvisation. So the initial um, batch that I, that that I got, yeah, it was quite a small data set. So um, I re-ran the process of creating the data set and generated some uh, some more examples. Uh, some more, um, basically, there's a, there are ways of enhancing the data artificially um, to get more data, essentially, data augmentation. So I'll just play, this is from Epoch, Epoch 80. I think it trained for about a, uh, about eight, I think this is the last Epoch, actually. So it stopped training after this. So this is temperature 0 0.975. So I'll just play that this view. It's very nice. <laughs> Oh, that's so 
Um, yes, I have. I have definitely have shared my. I guess you could unshare and share again. Did you see that option to share your computer sound? Yes, I did. I did. Uh, I did. Can you just try again, just so we can do the presentation of this? It is all about the sound. You should be sure. Yeah, it has to be. I guess I'll send it to the computer. Uh, apologies for that. I will play that again. Yeah, so that was um, from Epoch 80, uh, but a uh, slightly earlier Epoch, um, at a slightly different temperature, uh, it's a slightly different quality. It's it, around this point, it had, it had trained as much as it possibly could, I think, uh, which is why it stopped itself at Epoch 80. So I'll just. So I'll just pause that there now. Um, so you can hear it's quite clearly a saxophone. The earlier training that I ran on the smaller data set had many um, issues and it, it didn't really, um, uh, you, you didn't get that kind of um, quality that it's obviously a saxophone, um, which I think you do with, uh, with, with this uh, training. So uh, one of the things that we, well, essential thing we have to do when we're training a neural network is to have input data and the input data is a data set and we have to build the data set. Um, so it comes from the input. The ultimate in input is a single audio file. Uh, for our system, we need it in WAV format, but that's just an idiosyncrasy of what we're doing. It's not necessarily always the case. Um, so uh, it might be pre-processed. It's always converted to mono, and we, we generally sample rate, so reduce the sample rate uh, to 44.1 if it's higher than that. And then it's the, the file is sliced into short chunks usually about five or ten seconds shuffled um, and the ideal size is about 2500 I like that kind of size but I will accept less than that if I if there's no way to yeah I mean but what if we don't have enough data well the thing to do is to augment the data to artificially increase it so we can do that through it's a fairly standard technique in machine learning and, neuron, and training in neural networks so consecutive chunks might be overlapped to increase the number of chunks and uh, there's there are other forms of augmentation in turn, uh, including pitch shifting time reversal adding noise distortion etc 
And so training itself, so the data set is processed through multiple epochs, and that's a kind of semi-technical term. Uh, one epoch is one complete pass through the data set, which is always shuffled on each uh, epoch. And snapshots are actually saved to disk. So you might be thinking, well, what is what you get at the end of this process? Well, it's saving versions of itself to disk in a, in a, in a particular five, uh, binary five for, file format uh, all the time. So you always have snapshots from uh, throughout the entire training, and then you can generate audio from each of these snapshots. So and there are hyper, uh, parameters of the system. Hyperparameters just means that the parameters that you start off with and you can't change them after it's it's got going. So such as the number of neurons in, a, in the layer of the network and uh, choosing the right parameters, hyperparameters is, is difficult and it's it's as much an art uh, as a science. It's, it's a kind of very intuitive human process. And the, the process of training the network itself is a creative process, I feel. Um, you know, it's a, it's a kind of, uh, as a composer myself, I feel that. So, um, and we have ways of monitoring this system as well. Some charts there. That just shows the, you know, the, um, the kind of, uh, essentially what you're trying to do is minimize what's called the loss, which is the main metric. And the, the loss is basically the difference between um, where the network is and the target, the actual data itself itself. So in the Beethoven example or in Francisca's example, it's it's how close it is to uh, to the input data set. Um, but you don't want it, so if it can't learn, uh, it's called underfitting. So you can see there that the lot, you can see the way that that has actually um, shot up at one point. Um, and so that was from another uh, Net, uh, network that I trained, um, which didn't train very well at all, uh, for reasons I still don't quite understand. <laughs> so this is actually from the first uh, training I did for Francisca, and you can see there, I mean, that indicates there, you can see that the kind of wavy, wiggly line at the top, which has decided to go its, on its own course. Really, you want that to be, the blue line to be closer to the, uh, as close to the orange line as possible. That's a kind of test. Uh, so it's testing the system as, as it's going along. And um, so that's overfitting. So generating output audio. So we're saving snapshots to disk all the time. So we can go back and we can generate fresh audio from any point in the training session and uh, of any duration as well. So those examples that I, I played uh, from Francisca's uh, training, those are actually uh, taken from much longer files, 10 minute durations. And I can, you know, generate as, as you know, an hour or, or whatever. Uh, whatever you like, and mul then also multiple files can be generated at the same time in parallel. But the raw output of the system is indeed, as Francisca pointed out, a probability distribution. It's not as if it's a spitting out audio. That has to be uh, almost, you could say, post-processed um, to be turned into actual audio data, So and then saved to disk as a file. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, that's just about it for me, and I will now hand over to Emily. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I can stop sharing my screen. Do we want to take a five minute break? Yeah. So can I suggest that we take a two or three minute break? If there's still coffee, help yourself, because we're just going to plug Emily into a different laptop. So Emily is going to speak about her experience with PRISM RNN and more compositional ideas around how to use AI. So come back in five minutes. Hopefully there's still coffee, otherwise you have to drink water. <laughs>
Can you see my screen? Yeah. Right. Um, just something yeah. here. Is it working? Right. Ah. Okay, I'll stop sharing now. Uh, sorry, Emily. Hello and welcome to this AI. Hi, sorry, Emily. It's me, uh, Bofan. Uh, uh, yeah, would you mind turning your camera on, if possible? Thank you, Francisca, and thank you for inviting me here. Um, to, I mean, so I'm Emily Howard. I'm um, the director of PRISM, the Centre for Practice and Research in Science and Music at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. 
um, and it's great to be here. Um, and following on, I think we, we thought I would just give a little summary of some of the, the work that PRISM's been doing over the last few years, and particularly around the PRISM's research software engineer and Chris's work um, developing PRISM sample RNN, and, and perhaps some of our other, some of the creative uses that we've had so far with this software. Um, um, so PRISM came into existence in 2017. Um, I, with I working alongside Marcus de Sotai, mathematician, and also um, David de Raw, who's a, an, um, he's a professor of e-research at the uh, Oxford University, and together we formed PRISM. We were lucky enough to receive funding from Research England, um, Expanding Excellence in England, funding E3, um, and that enabled us to establish um, uh, positions, and in particular wow. there was a focus for AI with this um, funding. So um, what I'd like to do is play you some examples, a bit like um, Francisca was playing you examples of her own work with Chris. Chris is explaining a bit the process, and I would like to talk a little bit about some of the people in our, in PRISM, who have used PRISM Sample RNN. Um, this is our homepage, and I would encourage you to go here when you have a bit of time. It would be, we've, we've spent a bit of time putting a lot of things online. You've got um, our people. You can see Chris there. You can see Bofan Ma, another colleague of mine who we'll hear from in a moment, a postdoc at prison. Um, and we've got lots of news and events. And we've also got a blog that we've developed extensively where we've asked people to write about um, their work um, on Sert We We have um, a software page um, that's linked to the GitHub that Chris is talking about. And we also have media. I'll show you that in a moment with a lot of our compositions. I, th I suppose we'd say that we're prisms kind of mathematicians, scientists, and composers, performers together. I suppose we're composer-led, because I'm a composer. My colleague, um, Sam Salem, is also a composer. And um, I suppose it's through the lens of composition that we're looking at AI. We're looking at relationships between music and maths, music and AI. Music and healthcare, um, well-being, and all, all kinds of things. Um, here's a page about prison sample RNN that we've developed. Um, and actually, this is, these are, this is really early on, because um, I think Chris started working closely with Sam Salen, who was working a lot in neural synthesis. And that's where they decided to work together and um, for Chris to develop the prison sample and encode. And in fact, I think we got, you know, I mean, we, we were kind of set up in, um, I think we had the whole team together in January 2020, and of course we know what happened then, it was complete lockdown. So it took quite a bit of time for us to work on this. And I think, um, I think it was by about June 2020 that we had the first sample RNN um, uh, uh, program. And then it was, Jennifer Walsh, who actually wrote the first um, piece using um, PRISM Sample and AI Generated Material, Islander data set. And um, she used this to reimagine some Irish traditional singing. And then we also had an undergraduate, Jose de Carano. Um, he collaborated with the Birmingham Contemporary Music Group. And this is the first time that an undergraduate, or indeed anyone, had a performance working alongside Chris as the software engineer. So, um, if I show you some of that, um, Jose's written a blog. Again, I sent it, sent it to it, um, working with Oliver James from the CBSO. Um, I think he, 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 you know, it was not a dissimilar project to the one that you're working on, Francisco, where he took some improvised material and work, worked closely with Chris and had some stuff back, and, um, then, and then the recording is there. Um, and I, I had... I wanted to, I usually write acoustic music, and I was writing a piece for a string quartet, and I wanted to work with Chris on um, recording actual material that I, this is changed for me, I actually wrote material to be recorded by a string quartet, then to be put into Prism Sample RNN um, as a process for me then to receive material back, um, and then to use that as inspiration to write an acoustic piece, so that, a, a bit of a different use of it. And um, I remember, because um, Chris, that was quite a close collaboration with Chris, and Chris was absolutely sending back material that was kind of in 30-second chunks. And I found that interesting, because it just 
brought home to me the way that I think about music, which is very much like kind of globally and uh, for a whole structure. I mean, so I suppose the whole piece was supposed to be about 12 minutes. So I asked Chris, rather than to give me a 30 second chunk, to give me like a 12 minute chunk of material. It was really interesting because then to just examine what kind of a form that the, the sample RNN took. And it was really strange material. Um, it was based on a data set of my earlier string quartets and also this new material, which was very repetitive kind of loopy material for string quartet. And what I found was that you got, um, in the sample RN, you got these really super glitchy sort of long sections and then these wild cuts into material that you could never notate or, you know, really post um, complexity material. And actually that, I mean, I'm sorry that I can't play you any of this, but I would love you to look out for it because Shield has just been recorded by the Piatti String Quartet and it will come out soon, but it's very much, um, I think you can really hear these changes, the sort of abrupt changes between this glitchy and other material and that absolutely influences the piece. I'm now going to play you a sequence of um, three people talking about their work. We, we presented this at the AI Music Creativity Conference um, last year. So it's a video of our work. I'm going to play Anna Appleby, who's a composer and doctoral researcher working um, it, at PRISM, and Robert Laidler, who's recently finished his work as a doctoral composer, is now based, has a position of postdoc at Jesus College, Oxford. He was also using AI in his work. And then I'm going to play you a little clip from Sam Salem. And these were three of the pieces that they're speaking about their work using PRISM sample RNN in a number of different ways. Now, let's see. This is also online in our media section if you want to see any of the other parts of it. Um, you can also see Chris speaking a little bit. Well, we'll, we'll start just after Chris because it was similar material to what he's been saying then. My opera with the BBC Philharmonic that I've been working on for the past few years is going to be premiered this October. The libretto has been written by a poet called Niall Campbell who's also doing a PhD alongside mine. I had the idea of creating a character who would have a whole electronic sound world that was very contrasting to the orchestral sound world. It kind of escalated to the point of creating a whole alter ego which I could perform with called Norisette. And from that I then had discussions with PRISM, including Chris and Emily, about how I might collaborate with artificial intelligence and I realised that my pop music was the perfect avenue to do that. So with quite an open mind and not knowing what the result would be, I sent my whole output as Norisette to Chris, the software engineer, and he processed that through, he taught it to sample RNN and the audio files that I got back were um, they're quite a surprise to me. It was really interesting to hear a computer singing in my voice effectively. And having got all this material back, um, it then gave me the idea of creating actually some work separate to the opera, as well as then working out how I would feed it into the opera work. And I created an EP, which is all about my collaboration with Sample RNN, and it's about the human condition as well. So questioning philosophically what it means to be human or artificial intelligence as well as doing this EP, which I then have performed live at, for example, Blue Dot Festival, which is a huge music and science festival in the UK. I've also used that material from Sample RNN in my opera. I loved the potential of this artificial intelligence kind of almost random chaos that you get. It's not random in some ways, it's, it's still constructed, but to a listener, it feels quite broken and chaotic compared to something that I've constructed. So it was the perfect avenue to use the sample RNN material within my opera. The major piece um, of research from my PhD is this piece, Silicon, which is a, a big piece for orchestra and artificial intelligence. Um, and it's in three movements, and, and each of the movements explores how AI might interact with the orchestra in a slightly different way. Um, so the, the first movement um, looks at AI that uh, generates sheet music or um, symbolic uh, generative algorithms. The second movement uses a uh, machine learning based instrument, so it uses live machine learning to generate new timbres on the fly, and this instrument is embedded in the orchestra. And the third movement uses um, audio generative AI. It mostly uses PRISM sample RNN, uh, which I trained on a, an archive of the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra's um, radio broadcasts. Um, and it also uses a little bit of RAVE as well, the, the algorithm from EARCAM. And I suppose more widely, this project is, um, yes, it's obviously about how to use AI in my practice in writing for the orchestra, 
um, but it's also about kind of what um, writing for an orchestra or being an orchestra means in a in sort of the modern world where for example um, we might not even need orchestras to record film soundtracks or people don't need them anymore and we might not need um, composers to write certain types of music because of machine learning and we have all these other concerns that come with machine learning not just to do with music and so the piece is partly about that as well. I'd like to introduce very briefly two projects first of which is a work for solo cello and electronics called This Is Fine um, which was composed during first lockdown um, as part of the New Unusual project run by Distractfold Ensemble and funded by Antoine Siemens Music Foundation. Um, so this piece is a kind of dialogue between a live cellist and a um, fixed media part based upon a, a neural synthesis algorithm, in this case Prism Sample RNN. So in this piece, Alice Purton, the cellist, um, she iterated a whole series of studies of uh, solo cello material with me and this material was then used to create a model um, which generates the fixed media output. The second project that I'd like to introduce is called Unsupervised, and it's run by the Machine Learning for Music Working Group, which is a group that I established with Professor Ricardo Clement um, of the Novars Research Centre at the University of Manchester, and uh, Richard Armendinger from the uh, Manchester Alliance Business School. So this project brings together practitioners and participants from acoustic and electroacoustic music, and also researchers from the Business School and the Computer Science Department at the University of Manchester, so it's really interdisciplinary. Um, th so there are many other projects that we speak about in this video. I mean, it's about 15 minutes long, and again, you could watch. I just want to mention one more project before we throw this open so that we can all chat. Um, it's um, the Wernicke's area, um, which is a project that I've been involved in with um, a new production, which is a theatre company based in Dublin, and the Irish Museum of Modern Art. And also, both um, Chris and Bofan um, have been part of this project. And I'd like to talk about a little bit about some of the tech behind it. What I'll do, um, this premiered actually in, it was um, a live inst installation in last October, yeah, last October for a month at the Irish Museum of, for Modern Art. And um, I'm going to just play you a little clip we wrote on this video, but then I'm going to hand over to Bofan to tell you a little bit about the, um, the sounds and the, the, the sounds design behind the piece. Now. There we go. Let's hope that goes. Still, still to be seen because it's still a work in progress. It's already been. We've got a number of upcoming projects, including the Wernicke's area, with a new productions at the Irish Museum of Modern Art. The work derives from and reflects the personal story of Deborah Boss, wife of Anu's co-founder, Owen Boss. Deborah underwent emergency surgery to remove a tumour from what is known as the Wernicke's area of the brain. And we're exploring brain seizure and neurophysiology through live music, installation art, performance, and an immersive sound design rooted in our machine learning software, Prism Sample RNN. We are. Yeah, so now I need to go over to Bofan. So, how best do I do this, Francisco? Yeah, we've got teams open, yeah. Online, so um, Bofang, you can share your screen then. Yeah. I need to just minimise that maybe, and then we go yeah. to here. Oh, well, there. Yeah. Oh, this. Yeah. Yep. Nope. Another. Nope. There we go. Yeah. That, that it. And so, Bofang, if you want to. Don't I? Uh, I think I mute that. Yeah. Oh, right. Was that right? I've muted myself. Yeah. Okay. okay. Bofang? You... That's okay. He's share share with us. Okay. Yeah, I see this. Um, oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. 
So just to follow on from Emily's um, introduction to the Wernicke's area, uh, I'm here just to give some background information. So the project's about um, this lady who's very close to a new production in Dublin. And she had um, a brain tumor and uh, um, suffered from seizures, epilepsy, uh, epileptic seizures afterwards. So the project was to um, use the, to use AI to recreate and reimagine the kind of audio hallucination that she had uh, during seizure episode. So we had um, collected a collection of um, recorded seizure sound uh, that's currently provided by uh, Professor Mark Cunningham uh, in Trinity College Dublin. And they, they record the seizures that, um, that are captured as analog events and digitized and observed in real time on computer that saved and analyzes digital signals. And we trained the PRISM somewhere and with this kind of data set. And uh, we also trained the PRISM somewhere and with um, the, the person who, 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 who's uh, central to the story reading a series of uh, seizure diaries that she kept. Um, and uh, we used all these kind of materials to form a multimedia installation which involves Emily's um, um, acoustic composition and a hour long um, sound design that's created by me. Uh, so I'm just going to play some um, examples of the sound that we had. Um, so here are some of the uh, original seizure sound provided by um, Professor Cunningham. And that went through the PRISM somewhere and uh, learning procedure, and that's how it responded. Example of um, AI Debbie reading that seizure diaries. Um, and so, I and we also worked with Chris very closely on um, different ways of combining this data, data set and how and, and, and to make prism somewhere and generate something that really compound and uh, that's something really uh, kind of um, synthesizing all the kind of information that we have and uh, to recreate a story that we uh, have heard. So here are some examples. Uh, I'll just play one of them. Uh, 
And uh, here's a short trailer of the project that we recorded back in uh, October last year. I believe that's everything from me today. I'm handing it back to Emily. Thank you, Bofan. And just to say, um, you saw that was um, the first part of the installation, and you hear um, that's my work for mezzo and viola, overlaid with Bofan's sound design, overlaid with Owen Boss's tapestries and everyone in the space. So, anyway. Yeah. reading of the diaries. Right? It absolutely is. And that was also part of the installation. So you had, I think we had a series of three rooms. Um, one, you had a kind of immersive brain, the brain, the brain seizure sound. And then you walked through this AI corridor where you had AI brain seizure sounds and AI Debbie's voice. And then you walked, and then in the inner chamber, you had the sort of our composition. So it kind of, you know, a sort of AI sandwich. Walking through the brain, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much to Emily and um, all the collaborators and everyone online. Um, really, what this was uh, started off it was supposed to be an informal discussion amongst researchers, which it still is. Um, so I really would like us, um, I hope you have a bit of time that we can have some questions, um, but also even just tease out some ideas of where we, some of us might want to take this work. Um, um, I've already briefly spoken about, um, you know, running something around ethics and music and AI a bit later on this year. Um, but I might, maybe we'll just sit here. Yeah. Um, grab what, it. what shall I do with these? With so can, they can still hear us, Johnny. I'm just going, can we maybe just switch on the lights here at the front and then... Um, just in case, if there's questions for Chris or Bofang. Yeah. Um, um, I've, turned the, I've turned the mute off. Is that correct? Great. OK. Is there any observations, anything you want to ask technically or creatively or to Chris and online? So please feel free, because otherwise um, I know some of you, Ada, you work with, uh, <laughs> you work with AI. And do you want to talk a little bit about the stuff you do? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I have a question which is not very technical, but I remember you were saying that whatever there was the information that was input was not processed live, but it, it like, first needs to like some further processing before it actually comes to life as, a, as, a, like an, as an audio yes, sample. So I'm, I'm completely new to this way of making music. So to me, the question is, yeah, like what's the potential for like live situation, and was was this the only option in which this could come happen, or how does it work? Yeah. 
So, no, I think that's a really good question because actually we, we were talking about this, uh, the sort of difference between generating AI context, which is sort of more compositionally, um, which what you've picked up on, which this is at the moment, that's kind of, you know, just training a network to respond in a way. Um, and actually, I, I was going to ask Chris maybe to talk a little bit about the difference between AI and machine learning. Um, because I think that might be quite useful to sort of tease out. But yeah, so so the, the, my my project really is about building a, a live performance ecosystem where you you train the network, but then you can work with it in a live situation. Um, <coughs> hello, was that you, Chris? <laughs> oh yes. Uh, do you want me to just? I didn't. I didn't really hear the entire first question, but I can say a little well, bit about... Well, I was wondering uh, if it might be useful to start with kind of teasing out the, the, the difference. Is there a difference between AI and machine learning, I guess, because some people might wonder... Yeah, yes. Um, <coughs> uh, they are, they're often conflated. Yes, they're uh, often I mean, AI, conflated. AI is a branch of machine learning, or, you know, um, generally speaking, I would say. Um, so... Uh, Machine learning, many um, classifiers, uh, because of course you have different types of neural network I mentioned, uh, um, classifiers, generic uh, uh, neural networks, what we do. Hang on, hang on a sec, wait, Chris. Wait, wait, Chris. <coughs> Hello? So, can you start again? I think there. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so, yes, I was just saying that. Um, Yes, machine learning and AI are not the same thing, but they're often conflated. You can think of AI as a particular um, uh, branch of machine learning. And even neural networks, uh, the, the, the building neural networks is a, bran is a branch, a subcategory of, of AI, one could say. Um, there are certain models, um, machine learning models, which have nothing to do with um, the attempt uh, to um, model uh, biological networks, the brain, the nervous system, things like um, there's a, a type of model which I'm, I'm using in another, another project called a KNN model, which is um, K, near, K nearest neighbor, you, you might have heard of that um, type of uh, statistical model. So it's not doing, it's not doing, it's not building a network, it's not attempting to model the brain um, or the or nervous system. And it's it's uh, it's it's analysing uh, an ensemble an ensemble uh, data set, and then comparing uh, the nearest uh, examples of the data set to the the sample that is uh, input into the system, and they're actually very, they're very good at classifying um, uh, input data sets, uh, which is why I'm using it actually in preference to a neural network in the work I'm doing at the moment uh, on a classification, a genre classification, or a gesture, musical gesture classification system. And so that works very well. And that's not a neural, neural network in any sense. There's no artificial neurons anywhere near it. Uh, but for generative purposes, if you're generating audio, yeah, um, I found that uh, neural networks, Sampra in particular, um, uh, is particularly effective and interesting. Projects. Um, Bofan, are you there? And I think Bofan has, a, has because he yeah. uses AI in, in a different more life yeah. setting, and I think that would yeah. be quite interesting. To... Hi, can you hear us again? Hi. Yeah. <laughs> now we can see you as well, not just your screen. <laughs> uh, yes. So, um, yeah, I recently worked with uh, Ensemble Destructible IPs uh, entitled That's What They Said. And that was premiered last uh, November. Um, so my a little bit of background of myself. Uh, I I'm a I'm a Chinese composer, and uh, um, my practice centers around a kind of playful definition of this label and how AI technology can help me understand the uh, idiosyncrasies of myself being a Chinese and living inside a Western society. And uh, so I I work with kind of um, a biased or intentionally biased data set uh, curated by, by myself and um, collected by myself. So I so the piece uh, involves uh, totally separate kind of elements in there. There are AI, te uh, AI generated text, 
uh, trained by all of my writings of the years and uh, a collection of um, journal uh, sorry uh, news articles on china related affairs and i also uh, trained um, a real time tumbro transfer tool developed by google magenta uh, called ddsp so that software transforms live signal uh, onto whatever kind of tumbro you wanted to output to so I worked with these four musicians, and uh, I recorded their speaking uh, spoken voice, uh, reading very random piece of text, something like um, a car insurance policies, uh, and uh, journal articles, and uh, whatever the, whatever the, they they want to read. And I also recorded their instrumental playing, um, which just are really generic kind of practice of their instrument. Um, so the idea is to transform their uh, speak, uh, speaking voice into their instrumental sound and uh, vice versa. And I uh, also worked with uh, deepfake technologies and Chris, uh, thanks Chris who helped me a lot on um, exploration of uh, kind of different tools including Deepface Lab and uh, also many kind of uh, um, mobile friendly uh, applications. So. The piece is a live performance, in, including the four performers and uh, um, fixed media, uh, both audio and video, and also live electronics using that tone transfer DSP tool. And uh, maybe I can play some of it um, here. Just one short uh, extract. Uh, I'll share my screen again. Computer sound. Great. So, something like this. I stumbled upon this thread while searching for a concise, concise name for my own work. I immediately started searching online for a precise, concise form of expression that mimics my sound. I was intrigued by the idea of someone else taking advantage of the general phenomenon, yet leaving it at that. And uh, one probably one of the later sections where their instrumental playing is uh, their their voice is transformed to their instrumental timbre. So that, that's the project. I'll stop sharing now. Uh, just one sec. Go for him, but that was using the Google Magenta, um, wasn't it? That wasn't using um, sample in RNN at the end, the, the voice transformation? Because the question from the audience was around live, using AI live, because there's quite a lot of live bits in there, isn't it? Can you hear us? Yeah, sorry, I missed the first part of the question. About the... <laughs> so you, you, <laughs> we have a very basic question. Un unmute you. <laughs> um, the, the question from the audience was about live, using AI live. And um, can you maybe just one or two samples? Because you, th this was using the Magenta, the Google Magenta Tambra um, the transformation at the end, wasn't it? Do you yeah. want to just talk about uh, that live part? AI, using AI live in your live performance? Yeah, uh, it's, it's still a very new um, area um, and I'm, I'm still exploring. And uh, they, they released DDSP last year 
And uh, it, it's actually a very user-friendly kind of platform where you can train your own models uh, on their Colab notebook. And it only requires very small data set. And the, the, the VST is compatible with most um, uh, DAWs and you can easily um, use it in Ableton Logic, uh, Max MS, MSP, Reaper, or whatever you want to use. Um, so that was very straightforward. And I think um, it's, it's um, the, the recent uh, Rave release also include the, the, the kind of sim similar uh, features we, we can use in uh, live settings. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all very, uh, very playful. Yeah, thank you. But I think, yeah, the question about this, sort of, there is obviously a composition element that you can you know, use with some of the stuff and then something which people are building sort of live performance systems. Uh, Right. Maybe just as a follow up, and Francisca, thanks for your presentation at the start. It's great to see some Donna. of the new stuff you're working on. Uh, with Donna and, and other things. But I'm curious about your, because your intention is to build a system for live improvisation yeah. as a kind of co creative process with the, with the, um, with the data set. So, uh, what, what, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're hoping to do in that project and what are the, what are the um, specific challenges that need to be overcome? Be able to have you realize that? Yeah, so, so from my point of view, probably a bit like Bofang, I'm also at the start of self trained with Chris, obviously, the neural network. We're, I'm getting some, some of the output that you've heard, um, you know, sort of long way. So I'm working with a life coder called Federico Rubens. We're playing in Cheltenham in, in May, June. So we're going to use uh, some, of the, some of the AI trained, so it's going to be myself live with a live coder sampling my own sounds, but also using some of the AI generated other, the donors of me. Um, so that's kind of a smaller part of the system, but I'm also gonna work with, uh, the, so there's uh, the Intelligent uh, Human Lab by Thor Magnusson, who trains on wave models. So I've sent the same data set actually that the um, sample RNN is trained on, I'm working with a guy, Victor Stepperson there, who's training a rave model, which uh, I think will be better for a live set. Sorry, but I am going to find out because I'm only going. Um, so he's already started having some interesting things. So he started training. He's a guitarist. He started a, a he set up a system called Life Looper. If you're interested, it's really cool. So he trained a, a neural network using his own guitar playings, and then he uh, track has several tracks, and he's training the AI not only on his own input, but then on the sort of layered tracks of his own input. So I kind of find that conceptually quite interesting of like what you're actually putting into the system. So to answer your question more precisely, <laughs> Paul, um, I think there'll be different facets to this. So some is this sort of maybe more pre-composed. I mean, obviously, I'm, you know, there's so much stuff that you can have hours and hours of yourself. And <laughs> as I was trying to question my own reflections, is it really that interesting to have more of myself? And then it is quite static because you, you, know, you might have 20 minutes and you find, what I actually find is the sample RNN is amazing with multiphonics. So all of a sudden it produced these multiphonics and just seems to be stuck on there and for like five minutes just goes So maybe something I can't do by myself. So I think for me it's gonna be more of a process of how it's gonna change my own playing. Um, and the creative decisions I think are still to be made of what I'm gonna do with it. Um, I know that Federico, the life coder, is interested in using some of the material just for his own life coding system. Um, and then, you know, for me, obviously, to work in a sort of, it's a collaborative process, you know, not only for Chris, as I, you know, it's about the machine learning part, it's about me, what I give it, what I take out of it. And I'm hoping that later this year when I work in Iceland with Thor and his team, that actually um, um, Adam Pulsmelby will be there too, so I've already talked to him about that we might work on a system which is, you know, double bass, feedback, AI. I think it's part of a process always. I mean, I'm not gonna have the AI just playing a bit more of myself. <laughs> um, not sure if that answers your question because I am obviously questioning a lot myself of what it might add to my own practice or where I'm taking it. Uh, that's, that's useful to the idea of like, it's, it's, it's a variety of complex musical contexts in which you're mm, At so. the moment, it's mostly, it sounds like the, they're producing an audio file that you then sample to use within some other sort of system. Yeah, this. so I haven't, haven't used it in any creative way because this has literally been, well, the idea was that we were going to have this, sorry, I'm not even saying. 
the idea was that um, we were going to only train over the weekend before Chris um, wasn't able to come. So it's become a different process of me sending stuff, him training it. The idea was supposed to be more of a collaborative thing that we kind of train together and we make. I was really interested in what kind of decisions he's going to make in terms of training because there are so many decisions about what to use and I was trying to talk a little bit about this, this whole thing of what you make the machine forget, what you reinforce it, what you augment, you know, these are all really important decisions because the more you fiddle with it at the start, the more it becomes maybe human, I don't know. Um, so that process I guess I haven't gone through about working collaborative, yeah. more collaboratively. Can I just say, point out um, that we have um, Ellen Sargon and Bofan are writing a collaborative paper about exactly that so they've done interviews with all of us about what we did and didn't and Chris as well as it, what uh, how it was working with in that way so I hope that we should be able to have some thoughts on that yeah. and maybe we could speak to you too and so so one of the things I said to Chris when I started sending him the set because you know you give you give away your sort of hour of things to someone else to fiddle with and um, I, I did ask him to keep very sort of critical notes and um, so I'm just going through this with Chris, so he kept really critically, sort of like a diary of the things he did, the temperatures he changed and, you know, which, which bit he twiddled with and which bit he didn't twiddle with and so on. So I think all these, yeah, these are, that's why for me the process is kind of so much more interesting about what you do and what you don't do. Um, if I could just jump in there, just very quickly to say that the system itself, as with most machine learning, AI systems, uh, neural networks, um, has many parameters that I didn't speak about today, and tuning those parameters is, uh, is the hard part. And um, it's not something that you can um, automate or, you know, there's no manual. <laughs> it's a really human process as well, and it's a, not a me mechanistic process in any sense at all. It's something that one has to... Um, learn how to do and uh, feel one's way through it. It's a kind of intuitive process. Um, so it, it gives a lie to the, the myth of um, uh, machine learning being a very mechanistic um, mechanical process, a very dry kind of uh, process. It's, it's really not at all. Uh, and I, Like I said, I feel it's a, a creative process as well. Um, so I'm involved in the kind of creative process. And at the, at the end, you get a file on disk and it's kind of sitting there. And then what you do with it, you can, you can use that to generate as much um, fresh audio as you like. So I don't even know what it is at the end, whether it's an instrument or whether it's a compositional tool. Um, so uh, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm, that's undecided for me. And Chris, actually, I, what I really Absolutely appreciated not. when I started working with Chris, the first thing he said, oh, well, I'm more of a composer. I think more sort of compositionally. And I actually think from a musical point of view, and I think hopefully all of us in the room, there's so much to contribute from a mus musician's point of view about exactly in terms of how we use these sort of systems. And, um, you know, go going back to the sort of decision makings, and I think hopefully at some point, you know, we as a sort of music community, an AI sort of community, have something that we can exchange with people who are maybe thinking in differently creative or less creative. Maybe there are people who are thinking more in terms of, like, let's put that in and this is what we're getting out. But I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about doing it in a sort of creative way and the sort of decisions we make around it, which I think will be really informative for other fields, hopefully, as well. Yeah. You have got more experience because you've worked with neuroscientists and... Um... But uh, just saying, uh, from my own, I found it very interesting because, of course, Chris was always trying to make, uh, as he showed us, make the model closer to the real thing, whereas I found that usually I preferred... We always laughed about this because I prefer the worst, the, the worst versions always. You know, I think, no, don't throw that away. Don't discard that. That's the one I want. I know it's not perfect, but, in fact, it's more useful to me. So that's yeah. what I find it interesting. Artists don't prefer sameness. That's actually about the most different or, or divergent kind of yeah. things that are actually interesting. It, yet engineering is optimized in the opposite direction most of the time. So there's, yeah, there's yeah. this constant back and forth on that. Which is, which yeah, is and I think maybe that that is that that reflect the f reflection about what what that whole process will make it do me differently. That's the sort of 
argument and I think we've had this discussion like what has it made you differently compositionally I mean there is kind of a that sort of fold back process right where you listen to stuff and you go oh my god what, what is that but, but I think it's really helped me with um, collaboration in a wider way actually and so even you know these projects the, like the Wernicke's area collaborating with so many people I think this has all come through all these discussions about AI actually for me anyway um, really interesting yeah well maybe we need to sit with more are there engineers in this room <laughs> um, are, are there uh, other ref ideas, reflections? I mean, I guess one of the things, and I was, um, that's why Performance Without Barriers is hosting this as well, because I think uh, I'm also very interested in terms of access um, and working with um, differently, in, uh, differently able bodies and minds. And, um, and, and I think that's why this Vanica piece is such an interesting thing, you know, working with a kind of a whatever it's not a disability i guess is it oh, but a different different yeah. experience yeah yeah it's really it's been really interesting yeah both Anna and i are preparing some sort of we should have some more material about it soon it's just fresh and you know we're still working on um the recording of it and various things so we hope to present it further later on yeah can i ask about that actually um the was it a choice to work with a patient who had suffered damage to Wernicke's area specifically, or was that uh, um, an accident that came about? Because well, it wasn't an accident. I was approached by um, Owen Boss, who is a news, um, one of the, a news directors, and um, he came to me because we had worked together before, and he came to me specifically because I work with, often with scientists, and actually um, it's his wife, so it, it's very, a very personal story for him. And she um, was a singer, right? Yes, yeah, she yes. was a singer. And so she's, um, I think in 2014, um, she had an operation to remove this brain tumour, and it was successful, but it's left her with aphasia um, and also with epilepsy. Um, and then she has written this amazing series of diaries, which we kindly um, have, have copies of. And, and that, that's kind of what started it off, and he very much wanted to to make this work around that, that experience of his family, um, yeah. Well, the, re the reason, I mean, it's, it's, it's really fascinating, but it's also very coincidental because I guess the caricature of damage to Wernicke's area is patients producing what's called word salad, where they can comprehend language, but they can't generate, so they can <coughs> words and recognize the word, but often in kind of nonsense sentences. Yes. And some, maybe un unfairly, sort of characteristics of what the AI is doing is a bit similar, it's, produ it's taking elements that are recognisable as units or components of something, but then, I guess, generating in a way that's perhaps not syntactic, you know, or something like that. I think, I mean, there was a huge crossover there, and I think that that was why Owen was very keen to work with the AI as well. And actually, we felt that, and so did Debbie, you know, Debbie attended, like, especially that the AI voice was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Could I, I mean, just one thing yes. point out with that is that, um, Saint Laurent is not, um, it doesn't learn language, so it's not designed for that. So it, it kind of learns, if you like, the music of the, of the speech, um, which you can hear reproduced in the, in the output. So it's not learning language, it doesn't understand what's, um, what's being said, and it's not designed for that. Yeah. But, but then therefore that made it very, very effective in this way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Alex? <laughs> yeah, could I ask a question just about, um, and just for, I guess, for Ruby, really. Um, so, I guess there's a tendency with all types of art to kind of adopt very new technologies, and, and often the motivation for that is, you know, to see how this is useful for one's creative practice. <coughs> I wonder if, um, if there are any opportunities here to kind of critique the wider implications of AI in society. Um, is that something that you've kind of considered or you'd like to kind of dig more deeply into? Well, the, the, the AI normalizes everything. I mean, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, probably Bofan's the best person to answer this question first. Bofan, do you want to answer that? Sorry, again, I didn't quite catch your question. <laughs> Could you speak lo really loudly? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I was just wondering if, um, through working with AI, if it gives you an opportunity to reflect on and critique the broader implications of AI in society. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what's so interesting about AI generated things is that it captures the um, details and nuances in the data set uh, and uh, it reflects it in uh, very interesting ways. For example, uh, Debbie's um, AI voice, <laughs> there's a lot of like names of her family members uh, that can be picked out and there are some uh, uh, locations uh, in Dublin that can be identified from the AI voice, um, which, which as Chris said, it, do, it doesn't learn language, but it does learn the patterns and uh, what, goes, what probably goes after a certain event. Um, so I think that's a very uh, interesting way of thinking and critiquing about existing ways of working uh, in creative practice and working in sound and music. Uh, and uh, um, the way we, we create our own data set, the way we uh, play things after one another and to see how interesting kind of patterns can emerge from um, ways that we didn't really know about uh, beforehand. Uh, that makes sense. And Alex, I mean, just for my own, I mean, I've been working with AI visuals for about a year and of course I have already started criticizing quite heavily around sort of gender bias. I mean, I've prompted a lot, uh, like if you prompt a female saxophonist, I have taken out a lot of the boobs, um, which you probably didn't get. And I have um, kind of perfected my prompting technique quite a lot to, you know, so if I want something a bit more magical or, you know, like a, you know, so the cyborg thing works quite well because you get less of the boobs, but as soon as there's a female version, so, you know, there's obviously all this discussion and that's why I think we do need to have a sort of a further discussion around you know, access, inclusion, uh, biases in general, um, and whether that's from a visual point of view or from a music point of view. I'm, I guess I haven't heard any gender bias in the data that Chris has produced, but I guess that's why, in a way, I'm quite aware that, you know, being a female improviser, feeding, well, I'm thinking of her as a female machine. Good. So, Good. Yeah. so I don't know what, what comes out of it, but, you know, it's, it's harder to hear gender bias in, in audio, I think. No, but you can get bias in use, use of the canon and if you just use ran, you know, if you just don't think about it and create it, you actually will end up with a very biased set of, of sort of materials if you just grab them without thinking about them, I think. Because you often find that they um, accentuate the norm, you know. So is it, is it a case of navigating those biases when you're working with these tools? Yeah, I think, or being really aware of them is good, yeah. Yeah, and I think Chris spoke to this quite nicely about sort of being really aware of which temperature bits he uses and what he overlaps and which decision he makes when and so on. Um, I think yeah. it's yeah, a bit more obvious with the sort of visual things, but I think there's definitely, that's why I'm thinking as a music community, I think we have a lot to offer in terms of thinking maybe from different, through different medium or through different ways of how these things come about and how you, you know, what happens in the sort of training process. Because as you know, well, it, probably most of these training sets, a lot of them are still made by possibly male programmers. Um, so we need a bit of time, I think, also for, it's not just about gender, it's also about access and, um, yeah. other, you know. James, what about you? And uh, talking about access and AI, what do you think of all this? <laughs> And uh, I'm sorry, I will make the keynote available with some of the references that I was mentioning, but I know that some of the visual stuff will have flown by you, and I was very aware of that. But I don't know how to make video accessible yet, apart yeah. from... Um, I don't know, I mean, uh, one thing, this is just an observation from the beginning, I, I find it very interesting how your, you, Francisco, your way of speaking almost began to mimic Donna. In, in, the, in the immediate transition, and then you sort of moved away from it back into your sort of well, that, what I perceive as your normal way of sort of engaging. I don't know if that was deliberate or not, but um, I think this like you talk about like sort of this imprinting dialogue right back into yourself and through the machine. I think that's not so much from a disabled perspective, but like generally speaking, um, like it's, it's not just about how we inform AI, but how AI informs us back, especially in live performance contexts, right? Like, how does inserting AI into a performance ecosystem, like, 
directly alter the way you sort of dialogue musically. Um, I think there's a lot of room to sort of think about that, and like specifically thinking about biases, right? Like in introducing an AI that's full of sort of unforeseen biases into your performance ecosystem. How, is that going to negatively affect your, you know, your, your dialogue or your performance, or is it not? Um, I think it's all it's all worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really good observation, thank you. Well, that's why, it's, yeah, I'm working with Donna. That's why Donna and I are because I've become really good friends. <laughs> Miguel? Yeah, um, I have a, um, I guess it's this slightly technical question in how flexible the tools are. So the, the examples that you've given, uh, you play something and then the machine learns how to react to that. So if instead, we not, would, not react. I, uh, sorry? I don't think the machine learns to react. No, I mean, well, uh, predicts you know what uh, is likely to come from from your uh, audio. So something that I imagine uh, immediately is well, what if we play as a duo, and in the training I say for this input, which is myself, the goal, the target should be this uh, other distinct uh, audio, and that would make sense. So instead of creating more of me. Uh, I'm more interested in the kind of dialogues that uh, would happen otherwise uh, between musicians. Yeah, but I guess you could, you could. I mean, I've only started obviously training it on myself, but you can train it as a duo. And I come back to this, and I said to Emily last night, you know, I might maybe in six months' time I go back saying I'll just play with another cellist again. You know? <laughs> I mean, you obviously it's a sort of a process of finding out how useful that is, but. Are you saying what would happen if you trained a set on a on a duo playing? Uh, How? Not necessarily the duo, but is this you know the, <coughs> the um, from what I understand, you, you have your own recordings. So the the what is trying to learn uh, the the output is, is to be similar to the input. And I'm thinking about dissociating this. So for this input. What I want is this separate output. So it wouldn't be, you know, this could be a, a um, whether it is something that is recorded as a duo, but a separate file, it's not the duo uh, itself. So, so, you know, basically just breaking that boundary where, uh, where rather than imitating and then hoping for, for less sameness, yeah. actually training uh, on two divergent. Well, Chris, you can probably keep us right. I don't see it as the machine is trying to imitate. It's not trying to do exactly what I'm doing. And I think that's the bit which is... Uh, well, the interesting thing is that um, there, is, there is this concept of overfitting, this, uh, um, which I show, showed very briefly in one of the charts that I show. What you're trying to avoid is overfitting, which is the, the system if you leave the system run long enough, it will just learn uh, the data set very well indeed. Um, it, it's designed to switch itself off before it does that, but if, you, if that kind of failed safe wasn't there, it would, it would just continue to... Occur. So you, it's this concept of the loss, which is the metric that I measure when I'm... When I'm that I, I monitor when I'm uh, training the system. So I'm monitoring using these interactive charts and... Um, uh, so the loss is uh, you want. So you you're attempting to minimize the loss. I mean that's a that's a statistical term. It's a term from statistical models. Uh, the loss is the distance, effectively, very crudely. It's the distance between your target, which is say in the case of the Beethoven data set, the Beethoven sonatas, and the model at the at this particular time. And you're attempting to minimize it, but not too much. Not so much that it's so close that it's literally just learning literally what you give it. So they can, these systems can do that. They can literally learn your data set. So you're trying to find that sweet spot. So again, it comes, comes, comes back to the, to the issue of um, what I spoke about, it being more of an art, or as much an art as a science, if you like. Um, so you can't, you can't really, there's no manual for this. You just have to, you just have to do it and learn how to do it uh, kind of um, intuitively. But if I, that helps, does that make I, sense? I think some of the, the one of the question I, I do understand is about the intention, and I didn't go in intentionally to say I want exactly this as an output, and in fact that's why I was really more interested in the process and thinking of it more as an organic system of it sort of working with me and 
doing something with my stuff rather than me dictating what I want to put in and what I want to get out. Because I guess you can do that. You can say, this is what I'm giving to you and this is what I want you to generate. But for me, that's not as interesting. Um, I know it's just gone a bit past three, so um, and I, we, we, we also want to be chatting still after. But I wonder, if, is there anything else from, from people? Otherwise, we might wrap it up and say thank you to you guys online, Chris and Bofang. <laughs> Yeah, really exciting to Thank hear you. about your work. And Chris, good to see you in person again online. Thanks everyone for, for being part of this. Will we have a bit of a break and then come back, to all of us, to chat? Or chat? Uh, I think Simon's reading live and then we could seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks so much, everyone. And thanks to the amazing tech team downstairs, up here, up <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Get something he hadn't sent you outside. So I think he's still the same. Yeah, okay. I'm just gonna. Thanks.